<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Gustav Nilsson Kotte, and I work at a company called uh, Yeway in Sweden. We're a, a consulting company and always looking out for new talents. And we're hiring, so please let me know if you're interested. But it's in Malmo, Sweden, so it's a bit far from here. And uh, like roughly one year ago, I started to get interested in uh, two different topics. One was Hype Media APIs, and uh, uh, briefly speaking, it's about avoiding putting application logic in your API clients. Uh, and then Adaptive Web Design, I also started to get really interested in, and briefly, it's about coping with the multi-device web in a good way, I think. And what I found out was that uh, these two uh, solutions to problems were, actually, were, of course, independent solutions to the, the different problems. They were kind of working together in a nice way. And I thought, like, hey, maybe you can combine these two in, in some form. OK, so I'm going to demo uh, a Kanban board for you, written with, uh, so which is an HTML Happy Media API. And it's using adaptive web design at the same time. So it's both a web and an API. And there are some rules attached to uh, this Kanban board. Uh, the first rule is that you're only allowed to move one state at a time. And uh, another rule is that you're from the done state, you are only allowed to go back to the working state. So simple, but a few rules. So let's fire up. Uh, yep. So this is probably what you expect. So I'm not a great designer, but uh, anyway. So you can move this uh, ta task to different states. And uh, yeah, that's about it. But it's, I think it's also nice to accept having this overview, being able to focus more on just doing one thing, like I want to work on things, and then I, then I can verify it or mark it as done. So I can. Uh, be in, focused in this, um, in just a working state, and then I can pull more work um, to, that I work on. And yeah, it's verified. So, uh, and still I have a read-only view of, of the board so that I, that I know what I'm doing. So let's see how this thing works without JavaScript enabled. So as you can see, there's a lot of JavaScript going on here. Uh, for example, the navigation isn't loaded, and the board is not there. But I can still pull some items and work with them. So this is just to demonstrate what's going on with JavaScript and what's not. Um, uh, so this page is also a mobile web page uh, using former a responsive web design. And of course, it's looking huge here, but on a cell phone, it's actually quite looking quite OK. Uh, and the board here is, yeah, just a list of all the states. Uh, this is particular, not particularly interesting, perhaps, but if I take the exact same, um, same view as this, but on, the, on an API, persp API perspective, we see that, yeah, maybe you don't see that, but it's, it's exactly the same thing being rendered, almost exactly. So this is an HTML Hyper Media API, and you can move things here, interact with, um, with uh, the, yeah, it's, it's a regular HTML. I just strip the CSS and, and script tags. And if you go to the source, you can read a bit about the media type that I've used. I've documented the media type, um, kind of boring text, but some in important classes uh, that you should know about, some names and some relationships, how, what, what links and forms mean semantically. And I have implemented a tiny Ruby client, like eight lines of code, that consume this, this uh, hypermedia API in HTML. So I can move things, for example, from uh, the working state to the backlog, the kind of simple interface, and move them back and forth. Okay. 
So how am I doing on time here? Eight minutes. Yeah. OK, so what's going on? So first, let me back up a few levels. Um, if you have these kind of rules, like business rules, application rules, what allowed items can go to different states depending on which state they're in, or perhaps if you have uh, different user roles, for example, admins can do more than regular users, or so what are they allowed to see and do? And perhaps you have some different uh, rules depending on both the item state and the user state, then I think it makes sense to not have this kind of application logic on all your clients, because then you will have duplicated code, and that's regular bad. Um, so it might be a risk that you have all, actually different applications deployed because they have, you have missed some, you have a bug in some, some part of the workflow and one client. And that's not good. Also, it's hard when you deploy. You have to have a synchronized deployed because you don't want applications to be different. Uh, you know, this is important stuff, business-centric stuff, probably, what allowed states uh, and, and user authentication and authorization. So I think that it should be in the API, centralized. Uh, but then we have another problem, and that is how, do we, how can we like, express, how can we tell the clients about these workflows and rules in a good way? And the only way I know of is to use REST, and more specifically, REST level 3 hypermedia controls. So, let's talk a bit about hypermedia APIs. Uh, so, what is the, the hypermedia constraint in Roy Fielding's uh, RESTful architecture style? Um, there's a bigger paragraph written by Roy Fielding, but John Moore puts it very elegantly by saying, you do stuff by reading pages and then either follow links or submit forms. And if you think about it, it's exactly the same way as we as human beings interact with the web. We see th something, we follow a link or submit a form. And now the challenge is just how to teach, how to code both the APIs and the clients to kind of teach the machines how to interpret this, these links and forms and metadata. And so, I really like using HTML as the, as, as the media type for my API. Um, and there's a lot of reasons uh, for this. Uh, one reason is that HTML is actually one of the most competent media types. It's, a, it's the media type with most uh, hypermedia controls. Uh, it's also very old. It's like almost 20 years old now. It's been standardized over and over again. And I mean, if you ask any developer, like if you show them some HTML, they were like, oh, that is HTML. They, everybody knows about it, right? Which is, which is not something that we could say about many JSON-based media types. Um, also, there's great tooling support. You know, there's this thing called the browser, which allows you to visualize your media type. Uh, they would take that for granted. But if you compare with JSON-based media types, well, yeah, that would be a bit harder, right? Also on the service side, you have template engines, you have hint syntax highlighting, uh, more and more advanced stuff, uh, which I think, think is really good. Um, final thing I like with HTML uh, as a media type is it's great for learning about hypermedia. Maybe in production, for some reason, you don't want to use HTML, um, but if you want, are interested in hypermedia, then I can recommend you start with HTML since it's baked in from the beginning and it's ubiquitous and you have all these tools and knowledge. Okay. So, just a quick interlude here. I think JSON is okay. It's, it's nice. I like JSON-based media types. I think uh, it's very exciting that all these new media types are coming up uh, all the time based on, J based on JSON. And, I mean, the more the merrier. Uh, it's just harder for us to choose, but that's, that's a luxury problem, right? Um, but I really like HTML as the media type for my API. So, um, and that's maybe, yeah, you should try it at least and see what you think. Um, but to be honest, I don't, think, I don't think that HTML versus JSON is a pretty big deal. I think the, the real barrier to entry is actually uh, building and consuming, uh, yeah, on the clients, consuming uh, hyper, hypermedia itself. Even in JSON, you have to kind of think in a hypermedia-aware way. What are the links? What are the forms? How can I 
yeah, program for this. So, uh, yeah. But, so you need a way to uh, expose the metadata uh, in HTML. You can't, kind of need a semantic layer on top of uh, HTML. And that is uh, something I like to use is microformats and a new version here called microformats2. As you see, uh, there's a convention here, like one character and a dash, conveying the, that, that is, this is microformat. So it's nothing, no, no other type of class. Uh, so about topmost here, you see we have an item, an entity, with some properties, name, status, descriptions, and then some uh, forms and links. And if we drill down in the forms, you see that we have two forms here. Uh, one form that will move this item to the backlog, uh, go, and going to that action, that URL, URL. Uh, and another one that will move this item to the verify state. And this is the next like, primary state. If you move an item, this is the default state. Uh, this is this kind of metadata that you would like to send to the clients so you can change them in an easy way. Okay. Um, so, as I said in the beginning, uh, I saw some kind of commonalities between HTML Hype Media APIs and Adaptive Web Design. And, uh, but to be more specific, uh, I saw some commonalities between HTML Hype Media APIs and Mobile First. So, both of them want to kind of send as minimal data packages as possible, because as an API, you don't, you don't want to send unnecessary stuff. It will be angry clients then. And also on mobile, you would like to be very careful with sending lots and lots of data, because yeah, there's a limited screen, screen size, bandwidth, and maybe the user is paying for the data. Um, but that's only like one goal. The, another goal, uh, for both of them is that you want to minimize the number of round trips to achieve the end user's intent, so to say. You don't want to follow links, like 10 links, and have really tiny packages. So there's kind of, th these two are kind of working against each other, and you have to optimize that in a way that's specific to your application and your domain. And I think that this is common for both hyper uh, hypermedia APIs and mobile first. So, um, let's see how I'm doing in time. So just super briefly about mobile first. Um, you, if, you, if you go this, this road with just loading uh, the most important thing first for a mobile page, and this is, this is kind of taking it almost to the extreme, but like the most important thing for the user was that, well, if, if the user followed the link, to an article, that's the article. If, if the user wants to tweet, that's the, for link, the, the, the form of the tweets, and, you know. Navigation is secondary. It's something that's, that's used one or two seconds later. That's not the primary content. So you show the thing here, the primary content, and then you have links to a lot of other stuff. And then, uh, using a technique called aggressive enhancement, you can kind of load uh, follow the links and with Ajax, pulling the content in and replacing the link with the probably not the entire page, but at least a fragment. And this can be achieved also on the, on the server side to play. Um, and of course, then it could be a lot of Ajax requests, and then you can start to bundling the your requests, uh, making sure the API and the clients like take several AES requests and sending them over the wire. Yeah, and the server knows about that, bundling together, sending, packing up, yeah. So you can be effective in that way. And then you need to think hard about different cache profiles for different links. Okay, just to be transparent here. But what you can do, do then is to, uh, to decide, design time or runtime, if what, what those things you want to include. And eventually, you will end up with, uh, on a full screen and good bandwidth and whatever, uh, a desktop web. So building from mobile first to a desktop web. So, and so this is kind of a one technique in adaptive web design. 
um, aggressive enhancement or conditional lazy loading. There's a lot of different things, uh, different techniques in adaptive web design. Be responsive, we responsive web design being perhaps the most popular uh, of these techniques. And it, it's really an umbrella term uh, of a lot of different techniques that, and it's being developed and uh, examined really, really a lot, of, a lot now, which I think is really exciting. But all these techniques are built on a single simple principle called progressive enhancement, which is starting with something simple that everybody can use and then optimize from that. And this principle is perhaps something that some of you here might like or might not like, uh, but I, I think it's a good idea. And, but not for all things. I mean, if you build a 3D shooter game in JavaScript, come on, it's, it, it's impossible to do that with progressive enhancement. And there's, of course, a gray zone where you don't really know if, if it's an app or if it's more content-based web. But I think we are, uh, yeah, and some, some apps should be content-based web and some content-based web should be apps. But I think this is a nice principle to, to, um, to use. So what I'm... So what I find, find, found out, and what I've been trying to tell you here, is that HTML5 media APIs and, adapt, and uh, mobile first, they are, kind of, they are friends. They are kind of the same thing. They're optimizing for two things, to minimize the data and minimize the number of run trips. And then mobile first uh, is friends with all the other web browsers, all the web, web experience because you can you use adaptive web design to make better experience for better browsers. So this means that HTML5 media APIs, since all of, my, all of your friends are my friends, um, that you can use HTML5 media APIs and mobile first and all web browsers and devices with adaptive web design. So you can combine these two and the API and the web can be the same thing. So, what something important to think about if you combine these two, the web and the API. You need to have an exit strategy because uh, if you, for some reason, would like to split in a half year, one year, or three years from now, it would be kind of stupid if all your, both your API clients and your web browsers went to the www site. So you have, some, you have to have some, some separation on URL, URI level. Uh, maybe you can have some duplicated DNS entry, or you can have two deployments uh, pointed to the same database, or yeah, it's up to you. Uh, there are some other things that you should think about, uh, and I've been kind of trying to cover them uh, during this presentation. But if you, you can, so if you have the same code base for your web and API, you should, as I said previously, just just you have to separate your eyes first, and that's a simple thing to do. Then you optimize the response sizes, the package sizes, and the number of round trips, both for your API and your mobile web. And you might be surprised to see that, well, oh, there's not a, you have a, I have a summary site, summary page on my mobile web, but I don't have that in my API. And then you might ask yourself, okay, why don't we have that in our API? Maybe that would be a good thing to present for any client, right? And then, so it's, they're kind of helping each other also in the, in the design process. And uh, you can use Microformance 2 as a semantic layer, but uh, there's also other, uh, other ways of doing that, for example, using RDF-A or RDF-A Lite. And then you can use aggressive enhancement to make the mobile first page be, be, be better to pull in more content with Ajax if you have a bigger screen size, for example, or based on some other parameters. And you should use other adaptive web design techniques, for example, responsive web design, or, yeah, you have a bunch to choose from, and it's, yeah, like I said, it's a huge topic. And then you can optimize the API like I did. Uh, I can show you if you don't remember. This is just, it has no, no script, script includes, no, uh, no script tags, no CSS includes, 
And if you look at this, you see that there's, all, all, there's just the microformat class information. So in the here, I have some more classes uh, for styling, but those you can strip away uh, in your templates. So, so now I want to make a quick demo uh, again, how you can do if you want to change your application. So what I want to do is that I want to add an archive state uh, after done, that you can, and you can move back and forth between the, the done and the archive. So let's go into VI here. Maybe that's better. So this is, of course, prepared uh, in the routing and the controller actions. But so oops. So I make a transition from done to archive. And uh, my my convention is that the last thing here in the list is the primary action. It's just something that I that it shows. Uh, and from archive, you can go back to done. OK. Let's see how the console client reacts on this one. Oh, here's a little thing from the past. How embarrassing. But I can move this. Uh, anyway, I can move things from the verify to the done from the done to the, to the archive, and then I can move it back to done. Like that. So this was a, a thing that, that I didn't have to change one line of, line of code in my Ruby client. And of course, the, uh, the web will also be enhanced with the archive and you can move things back and forth here. OK. And so if you think about it, if I wanted to make this change on, for example, on iPhone, Android, on the web, and different clients, I had to like, do, this, do a split and like, hand out different user stories for different teams or persons. And they, we have to synchronize, and we have to deploy this um, and in a synchronized way. But here, I can just add one line of code, and the change is is done. So, okay. So, just a quick summary. I think that, and and this is perhaps the the, the center of of my talk, that HTML Hub Media APIs and mobile first are really very much in common, um, and then other. Uh, other persons have showed that mobile first and all the rest of the web browsers are, are really friends because uh, you use adaptive web design techniques to make it's just one web, right? So, and this means that HTML Hive Media APIs and the web can be the same thing and you can have the same code base for your web and your API. So, there's some good books on hypermedia. Um, and on adaptive web design. This is just a few of these, a few of those. There's also some uh, links online, uh, good slide decks, presentations. And there's a good site called uh, Resource Oriented Client Architecture by a guy, guy called Ste Stefan Tilkov and two other guys um, that I really recommend you to, to read. Actually, if you follow one, one of these links, you should go to the Resource Oriented Client Architecture. I think it's really great. And he's I guess he's from Berlin, at least he's German, Stefan Tilkov. So, thank you very much for listening to me. Here's my Twitter. Uh, the code is uh, available on GitHub. The demo is actually running uh, right now on Heroku, deployed both as the Adaptive Web Design site and as an API. Um, and I kind of blocked it so you can't add items, but you can change and do whatever you want. And then the slides are available uh, here at the bottom. 
So, um, and I'll happy to ask questions, to answer questions later, uh, perhaps during lunch. And thank you so much for inviting me and for having an awesome, awesome conference so far. <laughs>